ओके सो गुड इवनिंग इन इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग इन कैनेडा वेलकम टू द नेक्स्ट एडिशन ऑफ ऑनकोलॉजी बियॉन्ड द ऑबियस this is the second indian publication that we are going to be discussing and i think this is really very very important as central has mentioned something like a blockbuster or a game changer so while you guys have a decent time it is 2:30 am in new zealand here and it is 13 degree centigrade so it is my honor and pleasure to be here when uh, Uh, the ball is going to be set rolling by Dr. Amish Vora interviewing Dr. Kumar Prabash. Uh, Dr. Amish Vora is uh, my co-director in this program, and he is always doing the hard work to ensure that we select the right publication for discussion. It is my honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Kumar Prabash, who really doesn't need any introduction to this audience. he is uh, at the forefront of uh, medical oncology and especially innovations in medical oncology i rem- very distinctly remember that whenever there is a, a panel discussion where he is moderating any time there is a controversial statement made by a panelist he will start by saying i see what your point is but and then he will clarify with uh, thousands of evidence that will put the right perspective to the state and we expect nothing more now nothing less than what his uh, usual uh, fashion of uh, discussion is uh, if i continue uh, introducing kumar further then we are going to waste time out of the scientific discussion so i will stop here and hand it over to amish to start the interview thank you sir uh, and uh, i thank everyone for joining uh, you know as uh, senthil said uh, we are really really honored and privileged that we are uh, discussing uh, one trial which is done purely in india on indian participants and it according to many of us i'm sure it's actually a path breaking uh, or a practice changing paper where it's a beginning of the new era that is how i look at it can i have my first slide please so as the thing goes i normally present 7 to 8 slides of the paper what we are discussing today uh, so my title today i have kept it as low dose immunotherapy a beginning of new era next slide please so uh, you know i i'm i'm going to uh, name out all the authors because i decided that this is the right thing to do for the entire team for this uh, blockbuster as senthil mentioned low dose immunotherapy in head and neck cancer a randomized study by dr vijay patel dr vanita narona dr nandini manan dr rahul rai uh, atanu bhattacharji dr ajay singh uh, kavita nawale shweta jogdhankar rupali tambe sachin dhumal uh, riddhi savant mitali alone devanshi karlra zoya pillai shruti pathak arun balaji uh, dr suman kumar dr nilendu purandare dr archi agarwal dr ameya puranik dr abhishek mahajan dr amit janu dr gunjesh kumar singh uh, dr neha mittal dr subhash yadav our very own uh, dr shripad banavli sir and dr kumar prabash who is here with us next slide please so the main key objective was addition of low dose immunotherapy in chemotherapy in head and neck cancer patient does it make any difference as compared to right now we have been giving high dose chemotherapy immunotherapy to head and neck cancer patients next slide please so 208 patients were assessed for eligibility out of which finally 151 patients were randomly assigned into two arms all people who have not gone through the jco paper please go through it a very robust statistical calculations were done to arrive at this figure 
that random uh, assignment of one is to one, the one ex the standard arm was triple metronomic uh, chemotherapy, and the experimental arm triple metronomic chemotherapy with nivolumab. Next slide, please. So uh, the standard triple metronomic chemotherapy was capsule celecoxib 200 milligram twice daily, weekly methotrexate 9 milligram per meter square once a week, and erlotinib 150 milligram once daily. And in the experimental arm, fixed dose of nivolumab 20 milligram was administered 100 ml over 60 minutes every three weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the patient characteristics. A uh, few things which I wanted to point out. One was there was a male preponderance. Oral cavity was almost, uh, you know, sort of uh, preponderance. 90% of the patients were of oral cavity in both the arms. Of course, majority were tobacco users. Previous chemotherapy exposure to the right of my side. And that is something which I wanted to highlight. 46% of patients in the standard arm and 40% of patients in the control arm, in the experimental arm did not receive any chemotherapy. Majority of the patient failed within six months, those who relapsed or recurred. Um, very few had metastatics. And the last part is PDL1 positivity, where more than 50% was 25 to 30% in the study. Next slide, please. So this was the, uh, basically for uh, Kaplan near at one year, and we would talk about the result right now. I would want you to focus at the separation of curve, which started from fourth month onwards, if you see, and then it is separating, separating and separating. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this was the forest plot chart. There are a few things which are crossing the line of unity. Uh, we will discuss this in little detail uh, when we talk to Kumar and I'm sure Senthil also will have a look at that. Next slide, please. Adverse events was not much except for there was one patient who died in nivolumab arm because of reactivation of hepatitis and patient developed hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, and we will discuss about that. Next slide, please. Otherwise, it was extremely well tolerated. Uh, this is a quality of life, uh, you know, detailed uh, analysis, which was done by the uh, group which did this study. And I would like to ask Kumar, what is the practical meaning of this when I talk to him? Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we conclude? Uh, what we are discussing today? Low dose nivolumab in triple oral metronomic chemotherapy. Is it the standard treatment? Can we put it in the, all our guidelines? Or it is an alternative to the standard treatment. And I must congratulate the entire team of Tata Hospital because in the same JC on October 2022, when it was published, there is an editorial by Dr. Aaron Mitchell, and Dr. Daniel Goldstein, and they have discussed very interesting aspects of it. Can, can we uh, close down the slides and go to Kumar? So this is what we are discussing. Uh, Kumar, uh, Dr. Parik has introduced you uh, just few different lines. Uh, Kumar has done uh, MBBS MD in MAMC and then uh, DM from Kidwai, and right now he is the professor and HOD in uh, Tata Memorial Hospital. Uh, I think ever since his oncology career started, Kumar and I joined together, and I always say that where have I remained and where is Kumar gone? Uh, I think one of the most important aspect about Kumar, which I am really salute to Kumar because he taught us to look at Indian patients in the most scientific way so that we can have our own data. Nobody can challenge that. And there are many, many such studies where Kumar was part of those studies or he was instrumental in designing. And I know I remember there was a lot of buzz about uh, Jeftinib plus chemotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer, nimotuzumab study where people initially, you know, had a lot of questions. Uh, lung cancer consortium, which Kumar has, you know, sort of, 
created in a very, very big way. And now these studies. Uh, Kumar, uh, welcome on this platform and thank you for joining my brother. Thank you, Amish. And thank you for kind words. And it's always good to hear from your own friend and colleague, uh, those kind words. And thank you to you and Dr. Parikh, sir, uh, for the same. Right, right. So Kumar, we have a lot of ground to cover and we have limited time. So I would want you uh, wherever we can, you know, sort of save time so that I can move forward and ask you more questions so that Senthil doesn't have anything much to do. Let's try to do that. Uh, so uh, Kumar, uh, I will straight away come to the first question on this study, uh, the patient characteristics. And this can be answered in yes and no, because the next question is the crux of the entire uh, discussion. Male preponderance, majority, majority, majority oral cavity and almost 60% fail in first six months of the treatment with one third of the patients having PDL1 more than 50%. Is that what mimics your OPD in a day-to-day -day life? So before I start, uh, I, know, I know that you mentioned all the authors and uh, that was very nice of you and thank you for the same. Uh, I want to take two names uh, before I continue with the uh, uh, my uh, reply. Uh, and one is Dr. Vijay Patil and second is Dr. Vanita Narona. And so they were like the guys who really worked hard apart from all the support from everybody, including the support from the funding and the hospital to able to do this study. So thanking everybody uh, for the same. Now coming to uh, the male preponderance, we do know that majority of the patients are male in head and neck cancer in India. So yes, it is there. But uh, also, this is true that in the trial, it is a bit exaggerated uh, reflection of it, that we do have far more males than what we uh, see in the uh, clinic uh, as compared to what is seen. So that's true, that it is exaggerated, but yes, it is a, 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 a partly reflection of more males in this uh, no, uh, no study. Second part, you suggested that uh, less than uh, six months of uh, uh, no, patients failing. So. Uh, what we do forget for head and neck cancer that majority of the patients, they fail in one year. So if you take your failure of patients, almost 70% of them, they fail in one year. And you know, so we had a good discussion with our surgical colleague that we do salvage surgery. And I always uh, you know, poke a finger to them. A majority of them fail in a year. So uh, you know, the failure uh, time is so short that majority end up receiving palliative systemic therapy. And that's why you see those uh, you know, numbers, uh, the second part. Third part, more than 50%. Uh, this is a palliative setting. So that is where we did PDL1. We need to uh, do it in a relatively uh, treatment naive patient, which there is one project which is going on. So then I can say for sure that, yes, this reflects uh, those PDL1 expression for all the patients, uh, the all comers in our OPD or not. This is primarily, primarily the reflection of the patient who uh, have failed. And maybe uh, partly there is a possibility of uh, a selection of patient with having PDL1 being more, but in general, uh, I know this is the number what we have. Okay, perfect. So now, uh, Kumar, one of the most important question for today's discussion, and this was, you know, I had a detailed discussion with Dr. Sudeep Gupta also, because I keep uh, nagging him from time to time. Uh, when a patient of head and neck comes to you, whether it is a treatment naive or a relapsed patient, and you decide to give them systemic treatment, you have various options. Keynote 048, extreme, cisplatin 5-FU alone, or if they have relapsed faster, then either nivolumab or pembrolizumab. And now the last is oral metronomic chemotherapy. Kumar, I'm interested only and only in the patients out of these six different categories, which are the patients in day-to-day -day life you select for either double or triple oral metronomic chemotherapy. I think that would help audience a lot. Let's be only give only practical aspects. I do agree with you. So in case if you can give uh, you know, the patients uh, uh, you know, cetuximab based chemotherapy, that's a triple drug or uh, Keynote 048, which is triple drug, sure uh, uh, one should consider and that data is pretty strong for both of them. Uh, you know, in different scenario, and that can be separate discussion. Uh, but as 98% uh, uh, of the patient, they can't take it. So we are left with 5-FU cisplatinum uh, uh, versus cisplatinum. 
or oral metronomic chemotherapy. When our data for oral metronomic chemotherapy came in first line setting, as compared to single region cisplatinum, our practice did change and we had a good number of patients who started taking uh, an oral metronomic chemotherapy in the clinic in the first line setting with a bit of a uh, 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 decision making that if you have a high burden disease, then you do give them a taxin and platinum, not 5 platinum. I want to really know from people how many people do use 5 platinum. And my uh, you know, suspicion is, and when I talk to people, majority of them, you can put the number as 98% again, they don't use it 5 platinum. So it is taxin platinum or it is oral metronomic chemotherapy. That's what we do in clinic. Now, coming to triple metronomic, maybe you want to ask a separate question, then I'll take it up. Yeah, I will I will ask that separately. So, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, Kumar, um, oral metronomic chemotherapy is a standard routine first-line treatment for systemic therapy naive patients in our OPD. Is that correct? Yes, not only in the OPD. We have an EBM guideline where uh, which comes, uh, which is there, uh, which is a guideline from TMH, which is adopted by uh, NCG, that is National Cancer Grid. And if you go there, you will see that oral metronomic chemotherapy is uh, one of the options there. And that is based on the level one evidence that you had a 400 plus patient randomized trial to show that it is non-inferior, safer, and potentially uh, better. Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> this is what I wanted to basically highlight. So Kumar, uh, let's come to the crux of your study design. Why 20 mg and why three week? So uh, this is a uh, no, tricky one. 20 mg, I, I think so, uh, uh, you know, we have our review article, which we had written uh, uh, some time back. Uh, subsequent to that, there is a paper by Dr. Tanak, which is again a very nice paper, which suggested that, and this was based on again, the same literature we reviewed, because we were looking for an answer, what can we do to decrease the cost? And while going through the phase one data, we did realize that if you give 0.3 milligram per kg of nivolumab, then your receptor saturation is enough that it can be used in the clinic. And if you have a 60 kg weight person, then 20 milligram may be good enough in the clinic. That was the basis, that was one. We did have a concern that uh, are we using a lesser dose? Can we increase the dose? Uh, but Finances are an important issue in doing trial. And we did realize that if you go beyond 20, it becomes 40 because there's no other dose in between. Then the uh, uh, cost of doing the trial will be uh, beyond the scope, whatever we had. So you did have a science and also a reasonable financial uh, you know, constraint, which uh, made us uh, use 20 milligram uh, in, the clinic, uh, in the trial. Coming to three weekly, that also was to uh, do with, yes, some science, because we do know that these patients, if you take the half-life, which suggests that one can give this drug in six weeks or maybe beyond, and that may be good enough. Uh, uh, now, this was relatively arbitrary when we uh, took it for three weeks, uh, hoping that this will work for uh, this study. And again, there was a part of science involved uh, based on the uh, T-half-life and, uh, 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 and second, partly on the finances to see that uh, this works. So one can argue, why not six weeks? Mm, yes, uh, you know, <laughs> we were concerned about, uh, you know, are we stretching a bit too much you know, for the efficacy and hoping that 20 milligram, uh, six weeks will do as good as 240 milligram every two weeks. And uh, that is where we landed up. Uh, so a bit of a science and a bit of a, a logistics. I understand. So it's a practical aspect, what we have discussed that earlier. But Kumar, to your defense, you know, there was a randomized phase two study in advanced kidney cancer, right mm -hmm. from ranging from 0.3 to 10 milligram per kilogram. And there was no difference in the efficacy. And they also used every three weekly. And in fact, when nivolumab entered phase one data, the dose was given once in three months. And I don't know when it became two weekly and three weekly, and we all know the reason, so we will not go into the details of that. But uh, I uh, hats off to you for, in fact, taking this to the phase three level. So Kumar, that comes to one of the point which has been discussed on Twitter over and over again for your study. Uh, and that is your experiment and your standard app. Okay, so, uh, you know, I understand there was a lot of uh, financial issues while doing this trial also, and I'm sure there cannot be many sponsors who would willingly come forward to do this study. But uh, 
in your previous study, non-inferiority trial of 400 patients, you have shown that uh, double is uh, non-inferior to cisplatin alone or maybe superior to cisplatin alone. Erlotinib addition is adds on to toxicity and we all know that single agent erlotinib per se does not. We have stopped using that in none of the guidelines mentioned that. So according to me, when I read this paper, I feel either it should be nivolumab uh, 20 mg plus cisplat 5 FU or nivolumab 3 mg per kg plus cisplat 5 FU versus nivolumab 240 mg or cisplat 5 FU. Uh, don't you think that there are both the arms are experimental arms in this study, Kumar? So, uh, uh, you know, before making that com uh, coming to that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we used this dose and schedule before this kidney paper, and uh, so uh, somehow others also landed up with a similar uh, data. Uh, and thanks to them, you know, it validates that something went good uh, uh, in our decision making. Uh, coming to uh, the arms and both arms being experimental, or uh, you know, or uh, you know, one was routine. So that is uh, where we uh, you know, need to uh, you know, uh, uh, learn from West. I always say that uh, many things we need to learn from West a lot. How uh, experimental arm and routine arms we do uh, compare. Uh, now, let me give you an example. That science, you do have a whole lot of parallel development. And this is there for many areas in the world. For example, uh, if you take uh, you know, larynx uh, cancer, early larynx cancer, you do have uh, surgery and radiotherapy never compared directly. They have always been parallelly uh, you know, going on. Subsequently, we all know uh, many examples, but I'll stick to head and neck cancer. In larynx preservation trial, in veterans trial, it was surgery versus NACT followed by RT. In the R2OG study, which followed, the standard arm was radiotherapy. And radiotherapy directly being compared with surgery has never happened. But RT was the standard arm in that study. So, what I'm trying to convey that in science, you do have parallel developments. And second, the standard treatment does vary from place to place. As much we may say Keynote 0448 is the standard treatment. And if 98% of the patient can't take it, maybe we should be careful of making that statement. Uh, I know, and how we chose it? After subsequent to two drug combination, we did a three drug combination trial, which published again in JCO. And what it showed that if you give two drugs, the response rate is around 12%. Now, if you give three drugs, the response rate is around uh, no, 42%. Now, think about if I would have kept only two drug combination as a standard arm. The criticism should have been, hey, you deliberately kept the inferior arm, knowing that three drug had a 40% plus response as compared to 12% for two drugs. So we gave the best chance to the standard arm which had a 40% response rate, similar to what we can see otherwise and routinely being used at our place. And 5-FU platinum with cetuximab or uh, 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 pembrolizumab is used in 2 to 3%. And we do concede that this trial was not answering that question. And those patients, uh, that this trial has a limited use. And sure, we can discuss in those patients where we can use it. So uh, I know agreeing to it in one aspect, but for our patients, yes, the standard arm was standard arm. So Kumar, what you mentioned, one of the most important thing, and I will come to that very soon about the response rate. And I was flabbergasted at reading the paper and the response rate. But before that, a little bit more about the trial design also, mm -hmm. you know, because that is important. One uh, keynote 048 had 800 plus patients. Uh, Checkmate 141 had 300 plus patients. Your previous study had 400 plus patients, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this study had 151 patients. And it's a, such a wonderful and amazing study. Uh, so sample size is something bit less in my mind. And why this was, I'm not a statistician, but what I saw that you envisaged that there will be 15% improvement in the experimental arm by addition of just 20 milligram of nivolumab. Uh, you know, based on that, your hazard ratio and p-value was calculated. Don't you think that this sample size was a uh, little less. Uh, I just would like to hear your comments on that. Uh, because 151 to me, when I read, sounds on the lower side. So, uh, uh, so first uh, statistics, <laughs> assumption, and then I'll concede uh, why we did what we did. 
So as far as the statistics is concerned, uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, you can, can, one can go through it. Uh, we made the assumption right. Uh, I, know, uh, I know we had that sample size of 184. Uh, interim analysis showed that it reached the p-value what it was supposed to reach in uh, I know, interim analysis. And that's why we had to uh, you know, the stop the study. So we had to stop the study. I think so the question is that think about if we didn't have this uh, improvement in survival, uh, and then we would have you know, landed up 10% improvement in survival and trial would have been good, but there is a criticism that we had a lesser sample size. So I concede that uh, in a sample size, uh, we, we were a bit ambitious, uh, this is true. And here science was there, but there was also logistics. 400 patients, if I do a randomized trial, then I need to have the fund to uh, uh, run 200 plus patient immunotherapy. Think about the budget. The budget would have been uh, almost uh, you know, three times to the budget what we had and which we knew that we are not going to have it. So that is the uh, was another reason. But yes, when we calculated 15%, we did look into it. Is to have a reason to have these 15% uh, calculation and this number in the trial, uh, you know, and is there examples in the past? Yes, you do have. So took some map plus this platinum versus this platinum. Trial uh, response rate was higher. Overall negative study, 123 patients. So took some map got approval in second line setting based on a phase two trial single arm. And if you all remember, docetaxel in second line in lung cancer. Uh, people can suffer trial, famous one. Docetaxel, we are so stuck to it. This was 103 patient phase three randomized trial. So suggesting that, so we did went through it, what we are putting in, has it happened that these kind of you know, uh, you know, differences, we may be able to get it. And then we said, okay, with knowing the science part and the, also the logistics, this is the number uh, which may be feasible to do it. Uh, but you said, Dr. Kumar, will you advise uh, if all the resources is available, which is uh, 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 available at many places, that 15% as a uh, improvement in outcome, uh, I'll say I'll be careful, but we also stuck to the hazard ratio point, uh, you know, six around, which is considered fair. And this was the data which was there for full dose nivolumab, and we were hoping that there is a synergistic activity between triple metronomic chemotherapy and immunotherapy, which may sail us through. But I'm certain that if we had an analysis at four to five months, maybe thankfully we analyzed after some time that six months data or five months data. I am sure we would not have been so happy about it, uh, but it turned out to be uh, good in the end. That's that's you know that uh, Kumar uh, great that you answered that, and I wish uh, Doctor Sudip Gupta also would have been free because he also gave a completely different, nice perspective of sample size and why it is adequate in the study. Uh, I, I just asked this question because again there was a lot of Twitter floating around about the sample size, and you answered them very nicely, and I completely agree with every word of what you have said. Uh, my only question here, Kumar, is that I'll directly jump to results here because we have just 10 more minutes left. Um, why I said is that you have uh, assumed in your statistical analysis that the one-year OS of standard arm would be 28.3 months. And in your study, one-year OS of the standard arm is 16.3%. Kumar, there is a huge difference between the two. Uh, so what do you have to say about it? Has your standard arm underperformed? Very important comment and good. It has been picked up and uh, raised. So when we calculated the uh, 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 you know, uh, standard arm, uh, unfortunately, uh, we uh, don't have a reference. And this is very important, again, to learn from people who do a lot of trials and data being there in public domain. Why we talk about like when you perform a trial, how do you calculate? You calculate things based on what is there in public domain. What has been published? Unfortunately, we have a limited data from India, and that's a huge limitation. So we had two data, uh, and one data was there based on own immunotherapy trial of double combat, double uh, metronomic chemotherapy. But that was primarily platinum sensitive patients, and that was the evidence what we had, and we calculated based on that. But as you can see, that yes, you do have significant proportion of patients which are platinum uh, no, resistant in this uh, trial. And that is why uh, 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 
ओके अमीश या नाउ नाउ बेटर कुमार या नाउ बेटर या या सो your question is very valid uh, amish uh, you know and good you pointed out because yes it did happen that what we as though assume it is not uh, has come out to be in the standard arm and the reason being the reference data are very limited in our context and we had to find out some reference and we took our own reference of platinum sensitive patient for double metronomic chemotherapy and that was the assumption but here uh, we had a significant proportion of patient who were platinum resistant and that is what has led to decrease in the uh, one year overall survival and if we take from our platinum resistant trial data then our own one year overall survival is around 10% so here is 16% and it is a bit higher because we have a significant proportion of patient who are platinum sensitive also so that's why it is, has been in between and that highlights the uh, idea that more and more of us should put data in public domain so we got a more better reference and that's the issue with all our trials if you see trials from tata hospital uh, an assumption made and what we get for standard arm for n0 trial we had a similar issue and that's the reason because either we look for international data or some data in between not exactly for the kind of patients we are taking so we do make some assumptions where you know when we do this trial i i i agree kumar you know that was something but as you rightly mentioned uh, the best uh of the data checkmate 141 two year overall survival follow up data which has been you know just come 16% is two years os and uh, that is you know exactly matching with uh, your <laughs> looks like you know i hope that I, i know there will not be any tail in only chemotherapy arm and there is never a tail which is seen in only chemotherapy arm but uh, 16% is actually in a chemo refractory patient is a good Uh, one year overall survival and that comes to my next question which is very important kumar kumar response rate is something phenomenal my scientific mind does not agree to this response rate and help me understand you know uh, the best of keynote 048 the best response rate is 35 to 40% uh, in the best of the arm the extreme the best of the arm is 30% and here in your standard arm you have 45.3% response rate when you add 20 mg of nivolumab it jumps up to 59% 60% you know if this data is true and it is replicable kumar i am sure this can replace the every other treatment especially in chemo refractory are these data too good to be true or is this the consistent finding what you see so uh, what you have raised the question is absolutely right i totally agree uh, if you take platinum refractory patient for nivolumab uh, the and or pembrolizumab the response rate is around 16 17% uh, we had a similar response rate for triple metronomic chemotherapy in a phase 1 oblique phase 2 trial which we did which uh, we published in jco and uh, it got uh, fairly reproduced here uh, as far as the standard arm is concerned so it looks like that is uh, reasonably uh, true and uh, we also whenever we do a study we also look for external validation so we look for our colleagues uh, how it looks like so for triple metronomic chemotherapy uh, looks like this value is reasonably correct uh, that is around 40% which is higher than nivolumab so for not for sustained response rate for response rate uh, that looks uh, that's true uh, uh, i know the uh, uh, you know issue is uh, i know why people are concerned about uh, you know uh, who have not used erlotinib in head and neck cancer uh, because people don't use in uh, lung cancer and lung cancer label went away for erlotinib in mutation negative patients so there is a concern regarding that here you have a squamous cell head and neck cancer and erlotinib added now this data is not alone data there is data in public domain by a uh, western world when phase 2 studies which has not been taken forward for erlotinib alone with a reasonable response rate of 25 to 30% uh, you know depending upon which series you take it apart from that one of our surgical colleague dr sudhir nair he took a did a study in head and neck cancer for erlotinib combination in new adjuvant setting and again uh, you know that was presented in Uh, asco not published as yet but one can check that uh, abstract and we were administering the treatment but uh, all the evaluation was done by sudhir and the radiologist and you do have a, a good number of responses with this erlotinib combination so there is something erlotinib uh, uh, alone or in combination does in squamous cell carcinoma in head and neck cancer and that is reassuring people that uh, this combination uh, does have a fair responses <clears throat> 
for uh, immunotherapy to be added and having a jump in the response. Yes, there is some jump in the response and that we have hoped for and it has happened. The 15% jump, Kumar. 15% yeah. jump with 20 mg of nivolumab. I know, as I said, now if, they, if this is reproducible in clinic, it changes my perspective of treating patients, even those who can afford. And that's why I feel that this is very important. I agree with you. 15% uh, jump, and we should be skeptical for any data coming, and we should be looking for external validation. Now, having said that, the comparison of uh, Keynote 048 is uh, not fair, but Keynote 048. 5-FU cisplatinum cetuximab was compared with 5-FU cisplatinum uh, pembrolizumab. It was not addition. Here, in triple metonymic chemotherapy, there's something, uh, there's some addition there. And the fair comparison will be, uh, you know, keynote 189 in lung cancer, where you add chemotherapy, then there is a jump in the response rate. So it looks like uh, immunotherapy does lead to a, a bit of a jump in the response rate when you combine it. But having said that, uh, yes, we will be looking for external validation. Right, absolutely. So Kumar, we have four minutes or three minutes more, and I want to cover three points. So, you know, very quick, uh, this thing. Uh, most important question, patient who can afford anything under the sun, okay? And when I when I see Keynote 048 and there was the extreme arm was one of the comparative arm, the best uh, median OS is 14.8 months uh, with PDL1 more than 50%. Uh, extreme consistently, there is 10 to 11 months uh, is the median. So patients who can afford and it's a low volume disease, you know, we are not looking at the response rate so much. Uh, do you think that these median OS tells me that the low dose nivolumab is still not mature enough to be used in patients who can't, uh, who can afford anything under the sun. Very quick answer because I have two more questions, Kumar. So, uh, uh, no doubt, Dr. Amish, uh, you know, I totally agree with you. There's a four year survival data for Keynote 048. And if someone can afford it, uh, low volume disease, yes, uh, uh, the, and they can take it. That is what should be uh, followed at present. Okay, perfect. Uh, quality of life, you know, quickly, because I wanted to touch base on that and you have been hailed and your team has been hailed that you have taken this is very seriously and people were very happy. Clinically meaningful quality of life, Kumar, if you can give one, two scenarios, because, you know, Dr. Bharat always keeps telling me, sir, quality of life or response rate hona chahiye, bas, baki sab kik hai. So in, in that entire detail table, I got lost. So just nutshell, if you can you know, say, where did quality of life improve? So first, uh, improving quality of life has been tough in most of the study, and especially in head and neck cancer. Extreme trial also, uh, it was not statistically significant. Now, having said that, the way to interpret this data is, and people can go through to interpret is, what we have done, time to deterioration and time to deterioration of those quality of life specific parameter. So if you see that, uh, you know, if you have a functional quality of life, uh, uh, a functional part of the quality of life, uh, you know, where, where you have a physical, emotional, cognitive, by and large, if you see those curve for TMCI, it is, has been above the TMC, that is triple metonymic chemotherapy. So it looks like by and large, it has a positive impact, not necessarily in every segment, but this is one of the problem of quality of life uh, evaluation that not every segment it benefits. And usually it is uh, tough to uh, 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 show that overall quality of life is better in one arm, but that's what one should aspire for. So having said that, yes, it looks like overall there has been a positive impact, but you say, Kumar, this was the 10 point difference between this in each segment of quality of life, which was there. No, that was not true. Right. Okay. So, Kumar, uh, last question. Uh, with overall survival at one year jumping to 40% in low-dose nivolumab arm as compared to 16% in the standard arm, this is crazy result. Okay. We, we, are, we are waiting for it to mature also, but right now, one-year data shows is amazing. So, very quickly, uh, in a patient who where you or any one of us have decided triple oral metronomic chemotherapy or a double oral metronomic chemotherapy, if patient can afford low dose nivolumab addition of 20 milligram is a given and we should start practicing that in our day-to-day -day life. Yes or no, Kumar? Yes. I, you know, uh, I, I showed you when I say this, uh, I uh, look at many aspects of uh, data uh, which is available with me 
many of the data which is not here and you know we can't put all the data uh, here and you uh, you know then only i make a statement i say yes uh, please you uh, know if patient can afford it it is important to add you uh, know uh, give triple metonymic chemotherapy plus nivolumab if the patient can afford it in the setting of uh, uh, recurrent you know and metastatic you know head and neck cancer yes that is true great and the the last question parik sir is angrily looking at me at 3 am in the morning uh, would you transfer this in a day, not in a clinical trial kumar mm -hmm. would you use this approach in other tumor types also say 100 mg of pembro in uh, instead of 200 mg or uh, you know 10 mg per kg of durvalumab instead of 1500 mg would you do that and after that over to parik sir and sir last question from my side so this is where uh, you know i have made statement at multiple places where people have asked me you know assessing no we should be uh, this is very important that we should not be sensational uh, you know whatever data comes to to say that everywhere uh, one can use 20 mg nivolumab and it will be as good as 240 no this is head and neck cancer 20 mg in combination with triple metonymic chemotherapy where it works uh, for all other setting uh, there is some data what you mentioned for kidney cancer there is some data for hodgkin disease so we really need to work hard uh, all of us to see that multiple places uh, this uh, you know uh, because i am aware of more data because we are running another study where we are using only low dose nivolumab 20 mg and i am aware of data partly because it is open label so i'll say no there should be a caution uh, to the people that Uh, not always uh, 20 mg is not the only low dose 40 mg is also low dose 100 is low dose no uh, i know 6 uh, weeks is low dose 8 weeks is low dose so we are this is the first step we know this concept is useful now to application of this concept we need to work hard uh, site by site uh, tumor by tumor situation by situation to understand now if this concept and dose at multiple situation start becoming very good then maybe we can say that okay you know one can fairly freely use it but as on date uh, no it's not a good idea to extrapolate this uh, dose and combination everywhere congratulations kumar again and thank you so much for sharing all these things you know that i and you both of us love to talk about go on and on but there is always a time limit to everything but i always learn a lot from you and now i will continue learning from senthil but before that over to parik sir thank you thank you so much thank you thank you very much uh, kumar and amish amish it is only not even 8 o'clock for you but still you seem to be more sleepy than i am at 3 am uh, you were saying that uh, i am looking angrily it was actually in awe of the fantastic uh, discussion that you have carried out with kumar and uh, kumar we really appreciate the clarifications especially about the scientific rationale about how the dose were selected how the schedule was selected and finally your conclusion about uh, why this uh, data is applicable only to head and neck cancer and not to uh, other situations uh, now it is my our privilege uh, to hand over to dr senthil rajappa who is the moderator for the panel discussion Mm -hmm. and as is uh, usually expected from senthil we will have a lively and a very balanced discussion so over to you senthil and senthil uh, uh, senthil your panelists are uh, again the stalwarts um, senthil started sharing the screening um, so we have senthil can you introduce yeah yeah uh, you you want to go ahead go ahead uh, नहीं नहीं मेरे को निकालना पड़ेगा बट आई रिमेम्बर डॉक्टर टीपी साहू डॉक्टर अमोल अखाड़े डॉक्टर वामशी डॉक्टर भरत डॉक्टर अंकुर डॉक्टर कुमार प्रभाष एम आई मिसिंग समबडी नो यू आर डन ओके परफेक्ट यस गो अहेड सेंटर या थैंक्स थैंक यू सो मच अमित एंड थैंक यू सर फॉर आस्किंग मी टू डू दिस पैनल इट्स एज आई टोल्ड कुमार व्हेन वी फर्स्ट कनेक्टेड इट्स बोथ प्राइड फॉर मी and privilege for me to be discussing this very important practice changing paper today uh, so it's 7:45 now uh, so we will probably do 35 minutes amish is that fine uh, so that we hand over the stage to professor tanner contai 
So um, no, I you, think you can take forty-five mm-hmm. to fifty minutes, and still depending oh, great, on I'm, how. I'm, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I won't bore you I for that. Very long. that will extend this by ten more minutes. Okay, fine. I won't bore you for that very long. Uh, you know, <laughs> we will also learn a lot from Professor Tynex summary, I suppose, as much as we've learned from Mark. So this is my summary of you know what is happening at the moment at Tata Hospital with uh, you know Kumar leading, advising. And so on, and Vijay Patil is probably Arjuna, you know, executing everything that Kumar wants. I'm sorry, I can't put uh, Vanita here. It would be out of context, so I have not put her here. But I think this is really what I feel, Kumar. Uh, you may want to accept it, you may not want to accept it, but that's up to you. But uh, you know, uh, I saw a picture like this, and then I thought this is exactly what is happening, and that's what uh, Amish and Professor Parikh also pointed out. So great job, continue to do it. God bless you. Uh, this is data from Tata Hospital itself. So uh, let me start by calling the panelists. Uh, Amol, uh, you still have the same 2.83% in your practice of patients who are receiving immunotherapy or over the years it has increased? Amol, uh, you can start. No, I agree that uh, hardly 2 or 3% patients end up using immunotherapy, especially if you have a practice which is mixed of uh, all class of patients. And I have discussed with my other colleagues who exclusively practice in the carport hospital, their number is not more than 4 or 5%. Okay. Vamsi, uh, has the number been increasing over the years? So the number has gone up slowly, but honestly, it would still remain in the same range of 5 to 7 or maybe 10% that Amur is talking about okay. maximum. So essentially, we are talking about less than 10% patients, even in, in, in potentially the corporate. Uh, Ankur, uh, you, you generally talk uh, you know, about your patients on immune checkpoint inhibitors. So is your percentage a little higher? Uh, slightly higher because, uh, and uh, lately because of the cost uh, effectiveness between cetuximab and nevolumab, they're actually the same. So, and the usage of PDL one lately, the CPS score slightly going higher towards 10%. But yes, okay. uh, over the last two, three years, they've gone certainly higher. Okay. So, just like the Tata Hospital data itself shows, I think it's progressively increasing slowly, steadily, but it still remains in the high single digits, I suppose, rather than a big jump into the, into the double digits. So, uh, this is what all of us are very interested in improving access, reducing cost. We've been struggling to reduce cost, though the pharmaceutical company has been doing its own small bit. And I think this paper is looking at lower doses of immunotherapy because reducing quantity leads to lesser cost and that's something that we are very interested in because this is certainly a life prolonging therapy it's revolutionized the field and we don't want our patients to be denied of a very important intervention like this so how i have structured today's discussion is i've used some of these uh, you know uh, responses from the opinion poll that was circulated in our groups in the past few days and i've also taken some statements from the editorial a very nice editorial that was written on this paper, uh, and, and we'll try to discuss along those lines. So question number one was low dose of email, uh, nivolumab resulted in an overall survival advantage. Do you believe this data is sufficient to change your routine practice from tomorrow? Sahu, yes, no? Uh, yes, in most of the patients, yes. Yes, most of the patients, yes. Because, you know, you've got about 30% of patients, 35% of uh, not patients, respondents, who have said not too sure and no, and I'm also trying to look at this whole paper from their standpoint and their eyes. We will try to look at it and why they probably have said that they're not sure or no. Do you think the response to immunotherapy is dose dependent, Bharat? No, sir, not dose. At some dose, once you saturate 70% of the receptors. Of okay, the so you think it is not dose dependent? No, not dose dependent. Once you practice changing for you, you already have some patients on this schedule? Absolutely. Definitely Absolutely, a practice, practice changing. changing. So, so as we go by, we try to look at why some are not too sure. And, and I, I've tried to look at certain reasons why some are not too sure or some refuse to accept this at this point in time as the standard of care. Right. So I think one of the reasons is this. You know, we, we keep on talking about what's the standard, right? So Vamsi, what is your standard chemotherapy for patients with uh, head and neck cancer who need palliative treatment? So I think actually I'm the wrong person to talk with. I have been a follower of triple metronomic for the last four or five years. Okay, so up, we have up actually front, up front, front platinum yes. sensitive. Up front, up platinum, front sensitive. platinum sensitive. I would offer pla- paclitaxel carboplatin. Uh, okay. in paclitaxel carboplatin. Paclitaxel right, we'll, carboplatin. We'll, we'll come to 
you know, there's a question on when you would use OMCT, just like, yep. you know, Kumar yep. was asked. I'm going to ask yep. that question also. Quickly, let's run yep. through. Bharat, what's your first line default? Uh, platinum tax all. Platinum tax. Platinum and tax all. Ankur. Ankur, are you around? If Ankur is not around, Sahu, what is your default first line? Uh, platinum and tax Okay, excellent. So, uh, Amol, why is it that all of us use platinum tax all? I'm showing you some evidence. Kumar keeps talking about this evidence time and again that there is certainly no evidence to say that combination chemotherapy prolongs overall survival. The response rate also is a little bit daisy. It seems to be a little higher, but not consistently higher. So, Amol, uh, any, I, I'm not able to show you. Amol, your connection probably is not all right. Okay, let's let's get to Vamsi. I can't hear you, Amol. Vamsi, uh, what do you think is our logic behind using combination chemotherapy? I also use Paclitex. I hope I'm not. So, I think it's more of just a... Amol, we can't hear you, Amol. It is not my voice. Vaccines and platinum. We can't hear you at all, Amol. Maybe you need to log off and log in again. Please do that. Somebody else's voice. Oh, is that somebody else's voice? That's Ankur's voice. Okay, Ankur's voice. I'm sorry, Amol. Uh, your thoughts on combination chemotherapy. I think one of the reasons why some people are not sure is that OMCT is typically not the chemo that we use, at least in platinum sensitive setting. What are your thoughts? If the patient is upfront metastatic and de novo platinum sensitive, we do use platinum based doublet, that is platinum plus uh, um, methotaxel. <coughs> to our platinum refractory, we may consider OMCT. So okay, so, so so what is your what is your logic behind using combination of all? Because we keep on talking about standard uh, paclitaxel carboplatin is typically not standard. It's standard for us maybe, but it's not the international standard. Any reasons why we've kind of adopted it so very easily? Because of the because the other standard that we are talking is the uh, is the paclitaxel carboplatin plus cetuximab that is very difficult uh, for most of our patients to have access. So 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 Amol, just to stop you, sorry to stop you. That five FU cisplatin and cetuximab, which is not paclitaxel carboplatin, cetuximab. So, so where did we get this paclitaxel carboplatin or cisplatin? Cisplatin five plus uh, cisplatin five FU plus cetuximab. Versus using paclitaxel carboplatin. So generally, paclitaxel carboplatin is preferred because access to cetuximab was difficult and is still difficult for most of our patients. Amol, I'm not too, I'm not too sure there was a trial which randomized patients to 5 ifu cisplatin and cetuximab versus pacli carbo. So uh, anyway, let's not get into that discussion. That's not very relevant. So the point I'm making is that what we are actually using is not typically standard, but it has become standard for us. So so that's the that's the point that I'm making because for some patients. For uh, some patients, we use this couplet because uh, maybe our response. Yeah, uh, Sahu, you want to yeah, make so, a comment? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it's important for us to note that responses have been traditionally higher with couplet, uh, doublets. And secondly, if you look at these this platinum five FU, which have been classically in the trials all along, versus the taxane and the platinum, this is more convenient to use, lesser <laughs> of a polyday chemotherapy. And the responses are typically same with lesser toxicity. Excellent. That's why across the time we have moved towards as doublet, and it has been Pacli Carbo or a Dossi Car Platinum because of the what I told the advantages and the toxicity. Excellent point, well taken. Easier. You think the responses are slightly Doctors. better? The international standard is it? Uh, Ankur, go ahead quickly. Yes. So, so, so I'll take thirty seconds. So yeah, it please. was TP, TPEX versus Extreme. TPEX yeah. used taxanes, very convenient daycare. But that's not the point. So ASCO 2020, those patients who have used PPX followed by nivolumab and those patients who have used extreme followed by nivolumab, TPX followed by nivolumab, the graphs were separating. There was a survival benefit. Extreme followed by nivolumab, the graphs were kissing each other. So the taxanes always do the trick. There is a hypothesis that there's a new antigen concept when taxanes are giving Immuno works better and TPEX indirect comparison, TPEX and extreme have made our life easier. We are using now using taxanes more in head and neck cancer. So ECF extreme, uh, Arbitex, Cisplatin and 5 if you was, I would say eight years down the line we were using, but now it's always taxanes. Seeing the TPEX survival response rate and the survival benefit of 11 to 14 months, which was saved. Convenient. Excellent. Ankur, point very well taken, but we've been using paclitaxel carboplatin even before nivolumab was ever discovered. That's point number one. Point number two is this 
sequencing is purely a retrospective analysis. Yeah. Let's not get into that debate now. Very small but number. 20. A very small number is retrospective. So, let's get into that. So, so the point is not whether Packley Carbo is wrong or right. The point I'm trying to make is that we're using something that's not typically standard. So that's the point I'm trying to make. And I, I'm sure all of you accept that point. But uh, when do you use oral metronomic chemotherapy? Do you use double or triple drugs? Sir, triple drugs, we are using it. If you see, there is a drastic difference when you see the response rate from 12 to 16% with the double. We are having around 40% with a triple. So, and with, uh, with acceptable toxicity, sir. So, adding a arlotinib or a gefitinib, whatever you use, you increase your response rate by around 30% probably. So, which setting? Uh, is it in platinum refractory setting or in platinum sensitive setting? Sir, most of them are refractory. If you say the data is mostly for refractory. So okay. probably for me, whatever I was using was in refractory setting or okay. early relapses, sir, what I want to say. Very good. Something like a resistance setting is what you're, you're, you're using and you're using triple metronomic. Yes, sir. Okay. So Kumar, I just wanted to ask this question to you, Kumar. So in this trial, and correct me if I'm wrong, I just tried to go through the protocol and this is what I got, that the treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitor is continued till progression. So you did speak about logistics and budget as you went by. So, you know, with that consideration in mind, do you think two years would have been a reasonable time to stop the treatment? So what went on in your mind when you decided that Nevo would go on till progression? Well, you know, absolutely fair question. We did discuss and you know, all I said was all the discussion between the three people I mentioned. And one of the questions came up of persistence of response. I do know this question will be asked. <laughs> and we thought if we stop it, uh, you know, in between today also, there are 17 patients in the uh, in a TMCI arm, that is immunotherapy arm, and uh, five in the other arm. So five in the other arm also is continuing with the triple metronomic chemotherapy, a small number, Sorry. but those 17 patients now, we are hoping how they do. And that is, that will be the key. So I know median is not so important and it is, it, I won't say not so important, it's important. I know if uh, we would have talked 10 years back, this median was very important. Today, uh, it's tough to convince people only with based on median. So you'll see all kinds of things. And apart from that, what happens after two years, three years? And that was the reason uh, to uh, you know, continue it. And we are now uh, struggling to get those uh, uh, fund and drugs to see that they continue uh, taking it. Uh, okay. Because what happens uh, after that? Do they have that three years, four years? Because everyone will be asking this question because for Keynote and Checkmate, both of them now data is uh, for prolonged uh, survival. I, I understand. That's a very fair point. When you're using a small dose, when you're using it, ah, once three weeks, you're a little nervous to stop it. To stop it. How much is, has been this you know, immune stimulation? Has it been enough or not? Uh, I know just that it has happened that it is right till now. Let's see it is uh, remains right or good. In I, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. So, you know, I don't know whether you guys noticed that, you know, triple metronomic therapy is TMC, which is Tata Memorial Center, which is also something that I, you know, hit <laughs> upon as I was reading this. TMC, TMC kept on, you know, ringing a bell in my brain. So, it's probably Tata Memorial Center also. So, you know, that, that's another thing. Amol, uh, there's data, retrospective data from Tata Hospital showing that 40 milligram prior dose refractory relapse setting is giving you the same results. Again, smaller numbers, but, you know, you can't get thousands of patients with that dose. So are you using it in your practice, Amol? 40 milligram flat dose refractory. If you're doing it, yes, great. If you're not doing it, I'd like to know why. For those patients who can afford nivolumab for TMG, I'm using that uh, and have two patients. Okay, so if your patients can afford that 40 milligram flat dose, you are using it in your patients. Bamsi, are you using it in your patients? This uh, the small data set. Yes, not you're just using here. It. I'm using it in possibly across indications as well. Oh, excellent. We'll come to that point in a moment. You know, when we come to the other indications. Bharat, are you using 40 milligram? Yeah, second day with Vamshi in many of the indications. Excellent. Yeah, but good. Dr. Sendhil, just a kind of a disclaimer, if patient is affordable, yeah, 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 I understand. we offer I understand. a full dose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I entirely understand. Uh, that disclaimer goes without, uh, you know, claiming, should I say. Uh, very good. So, so that, so, so we, we are using these in selected patients in the refractory setting and, you know, I'm not sure across indication, we'll come to that in a moment. So the, one of the reasons I think that some of those, pay, some of those, uh, you know, respondents said not too sure or no, 
is that there is lack of use of cisplatin in about you know 60 percent of you know 40 percent of patients in this uh, you know data set who actually are platinum sensitive so is that accept uh, but you know kumar has also shown you nice data in a very similar set of patients in their double metronomic versus cisplatin that it's not inferior the response rates are reasonably good so are you starting to get a feeling in your mind that it's actually okay to not use cisplatin in platinum sensitive patients? I want to ask you, Bharat, and then probably Ankur after that. Is it okay to leave, uh, you know, cisplatin as one of the chemotherapeutic agents when you're dealing with a patient who's got platinum sensitivity? Yes, no, quickly. Sir, no, I would like to use platinum. In a- You'd like to use platinum. So we stick to paclitaxel carboplatin if it's platinum sensitive. Yes. Ankur? Carbo. Yeah, uh, always like to have platinum. Excellent. So you would like. Always. So so I think that's. But but you know I want all of you to go through the data that Kumar actually alluded to, and I will quickly show you that data also uh, in you know as part of this presentation. That's the data that you know uh, he was referring to, and this is what I'm showing you here. So we are seeing here that you know the response rates do not shown in this, but I'm showing you the patient disposition, which is very similar to what you're seeing in this present you know, TMCI study. And you see that though it was a non-inferiority study, you're seeing that, you know, the cisplatin curve is below the metronomic chemotherapy curve here. And that's probably uh, one of the reasons. Yeah. The, the responses, yeah, the responses in that uh, in this trial were not great even with the double metronomic. Yes. It was so, a single digit 11, 12% versus, 12% uh, is what? Yeah, is. versus 6, 7% for platinum. That's, and in that trial also, 60% around where platinum Refractory because uh, Tata Memorial used a three month criteria there, not the six month which is classically used. That's correct. So that's why I'm showing you all this. So on the on the left lower part of your screen, you're seeing that patient disposition. Yes, this was double metronomic, mind you. This is not triple metronomic. So with double metronomic, the overall survival seemed to be similar or even better with the uh, compared to cisplatin, which is one of the regulatory standards that is actually accepted. So if it's triple metronomic chemotherapy and there is a big jump in the response rate, as Amish had reasonably, you know, pointed out during the course of his discussion, I think it's reasonably acceptable in my mind with this data set and what you're seeing in the present data set that they have shown to actually give up the platinum. It's acceptable. I said not you should give up the platinum. I said it's one of the options that you can consider. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, uh, Sahu. Yeah, I think uh, even the authors across Kumar, uh, Boss, and others have across in the presentations, JSU and others have put it forward. The metronomic mainly in the platinum refractory setting. We come to that. That should topic. be very clear. I think no. we should be very cautious in putting forward uh, this metronomic in the platinum sensitive. Uh, Kumar, you want to respond to that? Uh, so, as uh, Dr. Sahu said, that in this study, uh, we had three months, for, but you had more than half of the patient who were beyond six months. And uh, there is a subgroup analysis. And it, it looks like that benefit remains similar. Uh, but I do concede, see, uh, uh, changing practice, what we have been using, uh, that requires multiple trials. So I do concede that you have a platinum IV uh, chemotherapy uh, 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 no, drug, uh, what Central was alluding to, that we don't have a very definitive data for it for each situation, but you have multiple study. Unfortunately, this is the only one study you have. So I do understand the skepticism for uh, people for replacing metronomic chemotherapy for IV cisplatinum or carboplatinum combination. Uh, but I suggest that uh, wherever our chance uh, using it has a merit there. Uh, but yes, as uh, Central suggested, is an option, uh, not the option. Absolutely, that's what I was trying to say. I didn't say everybody should change. I'm just saying that if you want to do this, there is data to support whatever you're doing. I think the point, that's the point. Because, you know, we're not using standard. So once you're not using one standard, then it's okay to use another that, you know, with an inverted comma is also not standard. So that's that's what I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, trying to tease out from. Yeah. There are times when the patient demands that I won't, don't want IV and uh, chemotherapy and you give some oral, they're yeah, happier. Yeah. You, so you have some data you have data to it that you know okay if i'm using i'm using with reasonable uh, okay so 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 far we you know we made two very important points one is that whatever we're using is not the so-called standard but we made it standard for our own reasons and convenience which is perfectly all right and acceptable point number two is that uh, you know there is data in platinum sensitive patients also that oral metronomic chemotherapy might be quite good and 
you know, it's also an option, not necessarily the only option. Kumar, on this table, I have a question for you. Kumar. You know, only about a third of patients have had radiation, while the majority of patients have had local disease. You know, metastatic is only 12%, 88% have had only local disease, I assume. And only one third have had radiation. Am I reading something wrong? Because uh, what we would generally do for patients who have local diseases, we would probably do some form of radiotherapy to palliate or you know treat, and and then probably look at using chemotherapy. So, what was the thought process when uh, you know you avoided radiotherapy in these? People? So, uh, uh, this has been uh, you know persistent question uh, for our many publication by uh, the uh, reviewer and the editor, uh, where we had to show those pictures, so which kind of patients we are talking about. Okay. So when we have those uh, oral cavity cancer, uh, traditionally what we read in books that locally advanced give RT. And you do have a whole lot of patients in our clinical practice where the tumor is from base of skull to your neck. And these are a whole lot of patients. And you do have fistula, you have bone involvement. And these are the patients where neither surgery can be done and neither radiotherapy can be given in these patients. And to convince those reviewers, we had to uh, 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 anonymize, anonymize those patients' photograph and send it uh, after permission from the patient. And once they have seen it, they did realize that, yes, what we are talking about, the kind of patients we are talking about, which have not received any treatment in spite of, as far as uh, know, AJCC is concerned, they belong to those locally advanced uh, know, uh, oral cavity cancer. There's okay. another data for, uh, from us, and that is uh, in the public domain, and another one uh, you know, will be going in public domain uh, uh, soon. That is our technically unresectable oral cavity cancer, which is again, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, work from the uh, same group from Tata Hospital. And what we do, those technically unresectable patients give uh, chemotherapy and then we send for a surgery feasible. So the patients who doesn't undergo surgery, two third of them or more, they don't receive radiotherapy. And again, these are all goes to joint clinic. And that is where the decision is taking, taken. Because again, we do realize the kind of patient we see that radiotherapy should be beneficial. So if you don't have a pain, if you have a fistula, if you have a bone involvement, then usually you don't give radiotherapy in these group of patients. And that's why you have a whole lot of patients where what you see that they have not received pre previous treatment and they are upfront palliative patient in setting in spite of locally advanced. By AJCC, they are locally advanced. And we had the data subsequently, what happens to these patients, because one, there was a time when we tried to push them for radiotherapy, give local radiotherapy or some form of radiotherapy, and median survival remains really uh, no, not so good. That is a Vedang paper, which is in public domain. Okay. So these are sir, typically I, my, yeah. Sir, sir, a very low number of metastatic patients. Don't you think locally failure, probably the biology is slightly better when you have a local retina metastatic. So just uh, think 12% metastatic. Are we not taking some good set of patients that don't you think so? Rather than having a metastatic or local. So your point is well taken. So if you in head and neck cancer, if you have a metastatic disease uh, upfront versus locally advanced, the outcome uh, may be slightly better in these patients for locally advanced as compared to metastatic. But we are not very certain about it. I'll come to that a bit later. Uh, but having said that, was there a, a way of taking it? No. These were all consequent, consecutive patients who agreed to take this treatment. And that's why in all our paper, this is not the first one. This may be uh, fourth or fifth one where we have a good number of patients in public domain for palliative setting. You will see majority of the patient remains locally advanced or local recurrence. So there is a biology part of it, how it fails, but also the way these patients behave in our clinic, especially uh, you know, in, the, in the place we practice. Okay, excellent. So let's move on. So uh, I understand that these were patients who are typically not candidates for radiotherapy. So, so they were not candidates. Worked. And they were yes. all discussed in the joint clinic where excellent. you had a medical surgical radiation and Point well taken. We decided, yeah. Point well taken. Uh, so and the idea, idea is that what I want to emphasize many times we have this perception because this is one of the problem with uh, uh, either NCCN or I'll say DIVITA, which is not uh, seen in the clinic that hey, you have got a different kind of patient where you don't put in the staging, you put in the uh, staging in a way, you call it locally advanced, but median survival of these patients, uh, we have another analysis where it remains really poor. Okay, right. So let's move on. Uh, so, so this is from the editorial that I have cut and pasted here. 
So the control arm we did discuss about would be considered non-standard. So the role for addition of low-dose nivolumab and the potential magnitude of benefit in settings where low-dose methotrexate plus, that's OMCT, does not represent a baseline standard of care, therefore remain unclear. So what the author is trying to say is that in situations where OMCT is not standard of care, the role of adding low-dose nivolumab remains unclear. Amol, would you agree with this statement or you would say that it's fine to use it in whichever setting it is as far as it's palliative? No, as, as I put in the doctor, okay, what is the definition of standard? We should have... Exactly. So what's the definition of standard? So we've been discussing that for the past 15 minutes. Standard as per our own data. And in our setup, where the feasibility of using routine animal drugs at a full dose is very difficult, we should consider this as our own standard. Whether the web sets is or not, it is should be immaterial. Okay. So you're saying what is standard is decided by the physician and the patient sitting across, not necessarily by NCCN and ESMO. Is that what you're saying, Amol? Yes. Stahu, agree disagree? Uh, I partially disagree. Yeah. You partially, think, oh, we generally yeah, say partially yeah, agree. You're saying I, I, you partially I, 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 disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so why we're saying that is uh, what the author meant and most of us agree even in this panel is we none of us consider the triple metronomic to be standard of care. We do consider in a selective patient group. Some may agree to this that they consider it, but a platinum doublet would have been a better acceptable standard of care is what I wanted to put forward. Point That's well probably taken. what the author is thinking. Point, point very well taken. So they are talking about 5 few cis platinum and so on and so forth. We are talking yeah. about a different platinum uh, uh, Maybe a taxin and a platinum also. Would have been it's, it's a platinum doublet. It's a platinum yeah. doublet. Yeah. That's a, that's a, so if I, if I say, you know, if I make a statement like this, for us, you know, in the first line, if it's a platinum sensitive patient, this combination is not standard. If I have somebody with platinum refractory disease, then this combination is standard. Would that be right or am I wrong in the statement that I'm making? Bamsi, can you answer that? Because we said this is not our standard for first line. So I'm saying, okay, that's all right. So for us, this is not first line standard. So we'll not adopt this in the first line. Let me adopt this in the platinum refractory setting, which is, you know, depending upon your definition, six months, three months, whatever that might be. Would that be a, a fair statement? So we are blinking on semantics here. Semantics wise, if you say standard, it is the one which is approved in a phase three trial against another drug and shown to have the maximum benefit. Based on that, you have to include a immuno full dose with chemo as your standard. That's what the maximum data is for. In practice in India, I would say it's fair to use metronomic as a standard because it is one of the options of a standard. And especially when you're sitting across the table from a patient and for them, a metronomic is the standard then yes, it can be considered a standard. That, that's how Dr. I would look at it. Dr. Sandil, can I come in here? Uh, if yeah, you please. At, if you look at 048, it did not include this patient. So uh, it, the, the comparison does not stand. If you look at so, 048, they had no patients who had failed within six months. So, so I think this is the best evidence what you have for the platinum refractory. The debate comes in a platinum sensitive, will you use it? Then I think the things start the now low dose versus the normal dose. That's how so I take it. Sir, can I put up Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are coming to this. Amit, sir, also pointed point. out. Yeah, yeah. That forest plot, sir. If you see more than twelve months, there was no improvement by adding all those things. For me, again, the trial also maybe the numbers are small, but the the, the maximum benefit was given for those who were less than six months. So probably for me, even the trial suggested. Even Amit sir mentioned that what that subset. There were few subset we did not do well. Like those who had not taken platin, there was no advantage of Nemo also. So probably, sir, uh, what South has said, refractory, I think okay. no confusion. For, for sensitive, there is a debate. But probably most of us may not change our standard of care, which is platin doublet. So, Dr. Sendhil, I think we should, you know, you cannot compare apples and oranges. You cannot I'm compare not comparing. I'm just, yeah, I'm no, just, I'm just showing saying, all Dr. of this Sahu. on the screen so that yeah, we know the numbers. Yeah, you know, yeah. is exactly what yeah. Amish, you know, Amish said. So that's the reason why I've asked this question. So let's take a situation like this, Vamsi. Mm -hmm. This is not your standard in the first line. We said that the Pakli Carbo would be standard. I agree. I accept that. So suppose somebody cannot afford full doses of PEM. So do you use 048 in your, uh, in your, in your practice or do you use Pakli Carbo and PEM? 
I use Pakli Carbo NPM. I don't use the so, so we are already not doing, we are already not following the trial, right? We are not following the trial. So, you know, I do same Pakli Carbo Pembro. We don't know where the data came from. The data is not there. So we are assuming it. You can say there is some Chinese data on Sintelimab with, you know, this combination. And so that's showing benefits. So this might show benefits. So we are actually changing our standard of care straight away there. Uh, Sahu, you want to make a point. Sir, I want to make my Sir, how sir, you continue then? No, 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 my basic point is uh, to be a very purist. Did zero uh, four eight has a platinum refractive patient? The answer is no. So Correct. I think this debate does not exist here. In a platinum refractory, this trial, the low dose nivolumab, is the only major trial that has come in, and we have to accept it. The second Sahu, one, what I feel is, yeah, please. Sahu, I just want you to you know ask you a small question. I I am not denying any of the points that you guys are making. So, second point. Oh, you want to make the second point? Make yeah, the second. yeah. Platinum sensitive. I think what the low dose nivolumab will do is will is replacing the extreme. If you look at the data, the responses, the duration of response, it is now better than extreme. Is it better than normal dose immunotherapy? Is a different question, which probably will answer. Sir, I just last point. Sir, is there a data of carbopetli femoro? The answer is yes. Actually, in this ESMO, there is a big presentation keynote 10D. So we have a data now, which is a phase four data, which has been published in this ESMO 2022. So, sir, we have a data and we are basically, we are ahead of the data and we are already following it. And that has been reproduced Point. in this ESMO 2022. Excellent. Carbo Point very well. So, so, so let's consider a patient like this, uh, Bharat or Sahu or whatever it is. I'm just trying to, so, you know, when I started, I was trying to tell you that I'm trying to look at this trial in the eyes of people who are not sure and people who don't want to use this as standard. So I'm trying to look at the various reasons why somebody's thought process is on that line and dissect this, you know, in that line. So let's say somebody cannot afford full doses of pembrolizum. Huh? There are two ways of doing it. One is you just use TMCI in the first line, even if it's platinum sensitive. Or you could use Pakli Carbo with low doses of immunotherapy. What would you do? Because we now know consistently that immune checkpoint inhibitors improve the outcomes in our patient. So what is it that we should be doing tomorrow if somebody is in the platinum sensitive setting, cannot afford an immune checkpoint inhibitor? What would be your suggestion for a for a physician like that? So, because I think that's the crux of it. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, I told you very clearly that point that this regimen is definitely better than the extreme. In every sense, and, no, and if extreme, you look across, so hang on, hang on. So, so I, I was, I was coming no, to that. Extreme so, is extreme is equally expensive. So if somebody cannot so, afford so, the immune checkpoint inhibitor, no extreme. So I'm talking if, about even if, even if even if they can afford it, I would still be going ahead and giving and offering them a low dose nivolumab. That if you have with, time, you can discuss that. With, low dose nivolumab with Pakli with Pakli Carbo. I would ah, not be doing. Okay. I, I would be doing it with. Uh, okay. Ripple. So you are, okay. Ripple. okay, okay, okay. So that's that's the point I wanted to get out of you. So you you believe that low dose uh, nivolumab works, and so if somebody is not able to afford Keynote 048 modified Keynote 048 Pakli Carbo Pembro, then you would use Pakli Carbo plus 20 milligrams of nivolumab once every three weeks. No, no, I oh no, okay. What's it? Metronomic chemotherapy, metronomic therapy with low dose. Because okay. the responses and the okay. anti-aging effect with the immuno-oncological drugs does matter here. Okay, so you are saying that if somebody cannot afford an immune checkpoint in 048, then it is this protocol even in the platinum sensitive setting. Is that yeah. right? Uh, yes. Okay, excellent. Very good. So that, that, that makes a lot of sense, which is what I started the whole discussion by saying. Anyway, never mind. Uh, Ankur, what is what would be your approach to somebody in the first line who cannot afford 048? So, so I agree with Dr. Sahu that if the patient cannot afford Pembro or Nevo at full dose, then this triple metronomic therapy with low dose immunotherapy is a very good uh, option because 60% response rate, what you're showing in your slide is, is wonderful, which we have. And, and the reason is which Dr. Kumar will tell, I want to ask him. So is this the same as anti-angiogenic and IO effect? Atizo did not, uh, Amino did not work in HCC. Bev did not work in HCC, but the combination worked in HCC and ABCP protocol. So is it the anti-angiogenic and IO effect, which is getting a 60% response, which are cytotoxic and or cytotoxic or cytotoxic plus IO are not giving? So I want to ask Dr. Kumar, what was the basic 
mechanism of action with this stroke this combination so uh, i wish i knew in detail but we had a hypothesis and which made the basis for this combination so you do have i uh, you know angiogenic anti angiogenic effect and uh, that was there i uh, you know if you see our phase 1 oblique phase 2 trial for triple metronomic chemotherapy and then we did work on seeing that do they have anti angiogenic effect and yes it it appears that they do have but apart from that uh, there is a, a other work by done by other people also which suggest that they do have effect on t reg cells <clears throat> Uh, hoping that you suppress it so that allows uh, immunotherapy to work better uh, but uh, i'll tell you those are hypotheses and uh, with some evidences for each uh, but i remember for cetuximab uh, when cetuximab failed in 0522 uh, there was a different hypothesis and when it worked for uh, extreme there was a different hypothesis and both of them the hypothesis was for a chemotherapy combination one was in palliative setting and one was in curative setting but you know and they say hey cell line this is what happens so yes i am putting hypothesis which is there one of our work and some other work which is there in by done by someone else uh, uh, you know which may be basis for this increased responses but uh, you know i think some more work needs to be done before i can say for certain kumar this forest plot was discussed would you read too much into this data or would you say that this this is all retrospective unplanned subset analysis at least some of those and then we would not give too much of credence to this so this is a fair point to be brought out by many people and could you brought for discussion and i was uh, thinking that this should come out for discussion so yes you do when you have this uh, forest plot there are at least few subgroup and at least uh, two of More them than one, yeah. previous treatment uh, not uh, you know uh, than not one. received and the second when has been the treatment uh, you know failure where it appears that uh, you know uh, the patients not doing well uh, i'll tell you another one story which is not uh, seen completely here that pdl1 score and we have done more dissections there <laughs> and we I, did get I, some I, I looked at the dissection also kumar <laughs> and then it's all over the place it's all over the place but what i'll suggest that it is a valid criticism for this uh, that uh, and valid uh, skepticism and what it suggests that yes we need to do work in those areas where you do have so is those patients uh they do in the first uh, you know untreated patient they have not done so well as far as the subgroup analysis is concerned can we have those 50 patients data to see that in that situation what happens so in those subgroup yes we need to work uh, for the to uh, see that uh, you know this is by chance what we are getting when we have uh, this uh, subgroup analysis showing hazard ratio crossing one rather than the real one but th that gives a uh, you know food for thought but in the meantime i'll suggest that uh, you know we take the data overall overall it is a positive one but yes dissection for upfront uh, refractory uh, you know uh, will be there correct so i think these are probably hypotheses generating you might want to look at it in your successive studies uh, again this pdl1 analysis though the response rates there seems to be some correlation at least in the uh, overall survival data that i'm showing on the left there's hardly any correlation the data is all over the place so i don't think you should make any decisions regarding usage of this protocol uh, based on the pdl1 data set at all uh, this is in the supplement if you want to go and look at it it's yeah. quite interesting i just picked up a few kaplan wire you know projections that are shown here very very clinically relevant amish asked more than a couple of times you know for me these were things that were very relevant feeding tube uh, painkillers use you know both of these situations where the tmci seems to be uh, really doing great so you know all of these are very very relevant uh, as far as our patients in the setting are concerned so for me if i just summarize everybody's views and thoughts and then correct me if i am wrong uh, and i agree with everything that people have said in the platinum sensitive setting if keynote 048 can be done modified keynote 048 packly carbo plus pembro that's the way to go if your patient cannot afford full doses of immunotherapy tmci is an option in that particular setting if your patient is platinum refractory then tmci <laughs> should be the uh, regimen to go to is that a fair conclusion of what all of your views are please raise your hands <laughs> sahu you want to make a point or you're raising your hands No, no, it's okay. Uh, I think it's that's okay. what we discussed. Yeah. Uh, see, the, the only point which I wanted to make is for some reasons, if you cannot give a uh, normal dose immunotherapy, 
okay. and patient has the deep pocket to do cetuximab or extreme protocol or TPX protocol. Uh, what I meant was this low dose immunonivolumab with the triple metronomic. The data said if you look across trials, not the good best way, but this looks as good or better than the extreme data. That's, the only point that's, that's what. The, so I didn't go into this because that would take a lot of time. In fact, and Kumar the has only made negative point. point I wanted to express is the duration of response, which Kumar was just uh, touched upon. It was around nine months for this their data, and eight point seven months, and that is something that probably I wanted to. If someone has the time to look into the melanoma data for low dose, if you look at the responses, the oncological outcomes are similar across doses, but the duration of response comes down for low dose, and that is across most of the subsets of oncology. So, so he did he did respond to that, Sabu, isn't it? Yeah, he said yeah, that's I know. One of the reasons why they want to keep it going and not stop earlier. Yeah, that's why probably the normal dose immunotherapy still is there. So, so the second thing, uh, Sabu, is also you made a very important point regarding extreme. Uh, you know, this is something that Kumar has mentioned earlier. Again, I just want to reiterate that point. Uh, you know, for patients with oral cavity cancer, the extreme overall survival was somewhere around seven months. And here is a trial with 90% oral cavity cancers where you're seeing an overall survival median at least of 10 and a half months. So I think in many ways, the point you're making is absolutely right. Uh, that extreme compared to what you're seeing here is not such a great regimen. But, you know, I again don't want to say if you want to use it in patients who have a pedial one that is you know, zero, you've got large burden disease and you want to cytoreduce, by guideline, that is the way to go to. But if you really ask me, I'm, I'm, you know, more impressed with what this trial is actually showing and I would not hesitate to use it in a patient like that. Uh, but having said that, you know, if you can afford extreme, you're very likely to also afford Pembro. Wamsi? So just a quick question, you know, I, this whole cisplatin sensitive or cisplatin refractory, if cisplatin sensitive but cannot afford full Pembro, mm. does it make more sense to give your chemo upfront and reserve your TMCI protocol, which we know works in the second line? You know, that's a refractory setting it'll become. I mean, I'm just I mean, asking because for me, the so, thing is, what do you do after your TMCI? It's a so problem TMC I face in my practical yeah. issue. Uh, yeah, yeah so you want to respond and then quickly, Kumar, and then we start winding yeah, up. Yeah, I think, Kumar, and I, I think uh, the data across trials, Mamsi, has shown you had a 50% take second line. Even in this trial, zero ported everything. So you will sir, only thirty six percent took in this trial. No, so that's only thirty six percent. Very less people. That was fifty nine versus thirty six percent. So, so for me, I will see what you do. So for me, I will want to use all the best therapies upfront. Yes, so I would not want to use chemo and then go to immune checkpoint inhibitor. That is my view, Kumar. What is your view? So, so uh, I agree with you. Second the chance of using second line, third line. We hope that majority patient can take it, but usually, uh, you know, it, it becomes you know tough uh, to do that. But uh, we do have colleagues, and this this discussion happens in uh, again in lung cancer. We say, hey, almost all patient I am able to give second line. No, that will be a different case scenario. But if the so, dip is around fifty percent, uh, choose the best one, and the best one we can debate. We will have our own best one in this setting, which we will try to choose. Yeah, one so, quick percent, point. Yeah, so quick point. My only point is like you know we are using chemo plus low dose IO. Versus TMCI plus low dose IO. And we know TMC plus low dose IO works. Whereas chemo plus low dose IO, we had know. the discussion. Yeah, whether it works or not, we really don't know. That, no, that's, that's just why, my point. You know, that's why Sahu yeah. made that point. And I also, you know, the seconded what was Sahu was saying that if you cannot afford the full dose IO with chemo, then this will be a great thing to do in the first line, which is what Kumar said, which is what Amish said. You know, we're coming back to the, you know, the same uh, point all over again. And that's why I made a modified algorithm for all of you, which you can probably follow from, you know, tomorrow morning, Monday morning, whatever that might be starting, like in most situations in our country, starting with affordability, and then you branch off into whichever side you want to get. That de novo metastatic were very small number. So can you extrapolate all this? Because Bharat, most Bharat, we don't have we don't have time, but we'll probably, you know, discuss that another day. So for me, uh, the next 10 minutes we'll close you know i i have a few thoughts that came to my mind you know kumar actually answered this question earlier about extrapolation i'm just trying to draw the parallel of biosimilars you know you you have data in one setting and then you extrapolate that data into the other setting you know her two positive breast cancer your data we've extrapolated that to stomach cancer we've extrapolated that to gallbladder cancer endometrial cancer we use it everywhere would it be fair to say that this is a, a reasonable analogy and, uh, you know, Vamsi actually said if somebody cannot afford, he actually uses it in the other settings also. 
Uh, Kumar, I want to ask you this question. Is this a reasonable analogy? I'm not sure myself. So, you know, I'm asking for a second opinion. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. See, within the biosimilar, what they did, they compared, uh, 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 you know, trastuzumab to trastuzumab. Uh, here, we have not done it. In fact, that would have been the ideal trial. And uh, that was another, uh, you know, question people have asked me and my group about it. Uh, why not compare a high dose versus low dose? And that would have been, uh, that would have been a very good study. And that would have answered many of the things we are talking about today. The only problem was uh, the the cost of this uh, uh, the, doing this trial would have been uh, you know 15 times than what we did today so around 10 times the dose or 10 times the cost and if you put it so this would never would have happened uh, if that was the case then i would have been far more comfortable saying that yes uh, you do replace it uh, and that's the reason i'm not saying to replace it because here we didn't use alone also and i'm aware of the data of 20 milligram alone in a very reasonable way 40 milligram data we have put in public domain. Someone commented regarding duration of response. Yes, we need to be skeptical, uh, skeptical about uh, once the uh, you know, kind of science, uh, uh, you know, the data we have. Data is good in a specific situation and it looks uh, very promising. And in those situations, I'll say we should uh, consider using it. Extrapolating that this low dose is as good as 240 milligram alone, 20 milligram as good as 240 milligram alone, I'll say, no, let's be a bit careful about that, uh, saying about that. We didn't do that. And again, I repeat, I I'm aware of a bit more data. So uh, I'm making comment based on knowing more about it. Correct. So not the best of analogies, but I'm, you know, always very tempted to say, because we, we always, you know, again, unofficially within our own so-called standards, use low-dose immunotherapy. We widen the frequencies between cycles. We say, come every six weeks, come every eight weeks. All these things we do in daily practice, uh, I think, uh, practice is very different from what happens in clinical trials, and that's why you need real world data. Amol, is it important for NCCM to accept this and add can, this? Can, is can, one I, of, can, yeah, I, can I take quick things? Quick comment, to... Kumar. Quick comment here. So, yeah, just uh, suggesting that, so I have no doubt about uh, that dose lower than what we give is, uh, I know, good enough. But what is that low dose? Is uh, we are all are searching for. Okay, sorry. So Amish is saying that we need to wind up quickly. Very good. Uh, so Amol, is it important for NCCN to accept this? Not necessarily. Okay. So this this probably is a question for Professor Tanak, and I want him to answer this question during the course of his expert comments. You know, all of us have you know been hammering this issue that we are using more drug, we are wasting money, and so on and so forth. But it is our own community which ended up developing this in the most flawed fashion. So, you know, uh, it's very disappointing. Now we are trying to reinvent the wheel and start by using lower doses and so on and so forth. So, uh, Professor Tanak, I want you to, you know, address this particular issue when you are, uh, you know, doing your comments. So, my summary is this, we can cut down on the doses. Kumar and company have clearly proven that there is a role for this algorithm. So, if you can't afford standard doses, TMCI first line, if you can afford standard doses, then the question of TMCI doesn't come. But even if you can afford, there might still be a role for use of this protocol upfront, even in platinum sensitive patients. Uh, platinum refractory, if you've not used immune checkpoint inhibitors in the first line, that is uh, you know, a, a treatment that you can use in the second line. I hope some of the uh, you know, uh, thoughts in the minds of people who are not sure or who would not agree that this is one of the standards of care would uh, you know, have cleared a little bit and I think it's very important to generate some good real world evidence and convince regulatory authorities and oncology societies to endorse these alternate schedules. And, and I have I showed this slide earlier in you know Best of Vasco. I'm showing this again. You know, these are people who have really championed the cause. Amol and Amol, uh, you know, they have really thought about it so much and you know brought this into many of our forums for uh, you know people to really discuss and think about it. And you know, that is for you, Kumar, and the Tata Hospital team. Uh, what if Destiny 04 got a standing ovation at ASCO? You deserve a standing ovation and much more than that. So this is for you. And, you know, uh, it takes us great pride in, in the fact that you guys have come up with this real standard of care protocol for patients who are really in need of this therapy but can't afford it. Uh, thank you so much, Amish. I'm extremely sorry, Professor Tanak and Amish, for exceeding my time by about five minutes. But, you know, I had so many things to discuss and I hope... Uh, we learned a little bit through this discussion and we are a little wiser uh, at the end of this discussion. 
Uh, thanks so much, and I hand it back to Amish. Thank <laughs> you so much, Senthil. I think Senthil and I discussed that should we break this obituary into two parts, and uh, <laughs> we can again rediscuss that because there are a lot of lot of discussions. And I think Kumar, one of the most important point, I felt I was the only one. but i think the entire panelists felt that this can replace the standard of care because there is exactly nothing like standard of care which we practice in day to day life uh, with that i invite uh, professor tenock uh, professor tenock uh, you know we're very very uh, sorry to keep you waiting so long um, but we are desperate to hear uh, your comments on last one and a half year of our discussion and on this study over to you professor okay Amish, thank you can i just uh, add my introduction yes, to sir. professor tanak yes sir i was uh, waiting for you but i am not sure so <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> sir so professor tanak is uh, emeritus professor of medical oncology at princess margaret but actually he is emeritus professor of medical oncology for the whole oncology community across the globe he has given a new perspective to what is comparison of oranges and apples and i very much uh, remember his comment that that particular uh, publication of his about the great to causing a orange and versus apple earned him more air miles than any of his other scientific publications so professor tanak always gives a new perspective to an age old uh, question or controversy and we are definitely going to have a very good conclusion from professor tanak over to you sir well i don't know if you're going to have a very good conclusion or not uh, now i guess the comment about the discussion uh, it's a long time since i treated head and neck cancer i used to when i was a younger oncologist but i stopped doing that when i was about 50 years old I think that these to me these discussions of the nuances of chemotherapy for this disease seem a little bit sort of misplaced. I remember these patients are miserable. Uh, they have nasty local disease. They are often uh, have a lot of comorbidity and I think you know these uh, regimens like extreme are ex are very toxic and they're based on tiny differences in survival i think the needs with head and neck cancer to be a much more major shift to answering the question not whether you make the patient live a month or two longer but whether you make them live a hell of a lot better and i think emphasizing on control of symptoms and quality of life to me in a disease like this where you know the the median survival is 6 months or so for most of them as far as i can see for looking at the survival curves shifting that a month or two is less important than shifting the quality of their remaining life and to that end the treatment with low dose metronomic chemotherapy or whatever you wish to call it seems to me a very sensible thing to do compared with more aggressive regimens and i think um talking about response rate is, is not very meaningful it's very poorly uh, correlated with either um uh, survival or quality of life so that's really my only comment about head and neck cancer use things that are well tolerated and clearly taxane carboplatin is better tolerated than cis cisplatin 5fu and certainly using low dose uh, treatment that is well tolerated uh, i think is important let me now come to the uh, trial uh, i think this is truly a remarkable trial it, it uh, certainly deserved the standing ovation that it received at asco I actually caught covid and couldn't go to Asker. I wasn't very sick, but uh, so I wasn't there, but I would have also stood up and clapped if I were in that crowd. If we look at immunotherapy, um what has happened is first of all, uh, we do know that for certain diseases, certain cancers that chemo that immunotherapy does have a profound impact. to improve uh, survival and generally is relatively well tolerated although clearly there are exceptions and serious toxicity but but it's been a remarkable thing it's been rewarded with 
a Nobel Prize for the two scientists, one in Japan and one in the States, uh, who largely developed the concepts of inhibiting uh, uh, PD-1 and PDL one uh, And yet, uh, and, and those scientists received a lot of their research grants from public funds, so taxation, charities, and yet the way that these drugs have been developed, uh, that type of treatment is not available to a large proportion of the world's population who could benefit. And I, I, I saw the slide that somebody showed that showed only about two or three percent of people at the Tata who could benefit who actually received immunotherapy. That to me is obscene. Uh, that we have drugs that can help people and are not available. So I can't change the way that drugs are developed, but the, the one of the things that happen with development of immunotherapy and of targeted agents is that we haven't learned to adapt from times of developing chemotherapy when there was a general assumption, not always actually justified, but... Uh, there was a general assumption that the higher the dose, the better the uh, outcome would be with chemotherapy. These were with simple toxic agents. And so you treat it until patients can tolerate any more. And that's the dose that you use. And that's the dose that's generally used in the classical Western chemotherapy for head and neck and every other incurable site. So that really is totally inappropriate when you're dealing with agents that have a known molecular target. Once you've inhibited that target, if you add dose, all you do is add toxicity. And if you, and uh, you may also, when you approve it at a high dose, of course, uh, have a very high cost. Now, if you actually look back at the phase one trials, uh, that were done of uh, these drugs, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and the PDL1 inhibitors. And I don't think there's any difference between nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Um, then what you find is that the in the early trials, there was no, of course, there is a dose response in that if you give no dose, you don't get any effect. But the dose response is at a much, much lower dose than that which has been approved by the FDA and the EMA. I mean, to give you an example, in the phase one trial of nivolumab, there was actually no difference in, you know, approximate endpoint response rate between doses of 0.1 up to 10 milligrams per kilogram. So it's a hundredfold range of doses, and 0.1 milligram per kilogram uh, is about six or seven milligrams of nivolumab. So you were getting, in the phase one studies, you were getting responses at a dose that is even lower than the 20 milligrams that you used here. And secondly, if you looked at target occupancy, uh, it remained there for uh, up to, oh, 70, 80 days. So giving it every two or three weeks is clearly much more often than we need to do. The lower you have the dose, you might need to give it more often than you use a higher dose, but even so, uh, the dose interval is not was not developed scientifically. And there was actually a very large study in renal cell cancer where they compared, I think it was 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, two and 10, and 0.3 milligrams per kilogram comes out as about 60 or 70 milligrams, still higher than the dose you use, but still a very low dose from that approved by the registration agencies. And there was, again, no difference in outcome among those doses. So why was it that the companies took forward, that oncologists were didn't object to this, uh, and the FDA and the ME approved these very high doses given every two to three weeks. Now, admittedly, they've now allowed a double dose to be given uh, half as often, but uh, that isn't solving anything. So I think what that trial showed, uh, and, and I think it's very important, was that a very low dose, it's about six or seven percent of the approved dose, uh, clearly has a clinic, an important clinical effect. And I think we need to build on that. Now, we've written a couple of papers on this, one uh, in Dharma Oncology looking at um, 
the you know what sort of doses we should look at and coming to the conclusion that probably on average a tenth of the normal doses or the approved doses are likely to be active for Pembro, Nevo, Atezolizumab, etc. And secondly, we've got a paper you may not yet have seen, a short paper in Nature Medicine looking at the ongoing trials that are comparing full dose versus low dose. Now, ideally, uh, as uh, Kumar said, one would do a, st a study comparing the full approved dose with a lower dose. Now, there are such trials going on in some parts of the world, particularly there's a trial using double the interval, but not doubling the dose. Uh, because we don't know what the optimal dose is. We know that 20 milligrams of nivolumab has activity, but we don't know that it's uh, optimal for inhibiting, and could we get a bit more effect if we used a slightly higher dose? So those are unanswered questions, but we do know that 20 milligrams of nivolumab and probably 10% of the pembrolizumab doses that are used I do have biological activity. And I think that's great for patients in India and in all other low and middle income countries. And certainly, given that, we should, uh, it's appropriate to use it. Should the trial be repeated? Ideally, yes. I'm aware of your Delhi trial, uh, which is looking at a variety of uh, different sites. Uh, using the same low dose of nivolumab. And hopefully, if that is also showing a benefit of that dose, I think we can accept that the dose has across the board biological activity. Lowering the dose will, of course, be fought tooth and nail by the pharmaceutical companies who, of course, want to make as big a profit as they can. They can't do what they've done when they lowered the dose of pills and market the different pills at the same dose. Uh, sorry, the market different dose pills at the same price because this is a fluid and you can always share vials. Um, but I do think, and I would encourage you in India through the National Trials Grid to do other studies of this type uh, in other diseases. It would be great if you could raise the money to do a trial of the approved dose versus a lower dose. But I realize that that is a huge challenge given the enormous cost of the full dose. So in concluding, congratulations on doing this trial. I look forward to the Delhi trial. I would suggest that as this, uh, you know, I saw this, people would change their practice. I would strongly suggest that you set up a registry where you record the outcomes of people who are using this in the real world. So you have that data. It won't prove benefit, but it will add uh, to the evidence. And, and please do try to support other trials of a very low dose uh, immunotherapy and, 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 and especially in, in other diseases where it is uh, perhaps more effective, such as higher PDL1 uh, level lung cancer, which is about 50% of the cases in renal cancer and, and so on. That's a great, great conclusion, Professor Tenok. Uh, you know, awesome to hear. Uh, I see Kumar on the screen still, and I see Pariksar also on the screen. Kumar, would you like to say something about uh, what Professor Tenok summarized? I think so. Uh, absolutely, uh, you know, right comment. And we know that, as Dr. Parikas Sir has said, we have been inspired by him and learned uh, a lot of oncology from him. And his comments were absolutely right. That we need to have those whole lot of data there. Especially what he mentioned last was important to have a registry because, as we heard from most of the people using uh, alternate dose than what is there in label. And it will be good to see that whichever dose they use, they need to keep using. But if we have the registry uh, two years and three years down the line, we will be uh, more informed. And we should you know, try to do that. Maybe we can get together. Uh, you know, Amis, we can use this platform to <laughs> get together to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you, so everyone. Stacking. Thank you, Dr. Tanak. Thank you so much for all the comments. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Amish, you Professor Tanak. Uh, yes, and uh, Parik sir, we all know that you are the one, once we th think of some starting registry, you are the one who will take initiative and make us, all of us go and start doing that. So we look at you, Parik sir, for that. 
but this was wonderful. Uh, you know, again, um, I thank you very much for being there and uh, we had a great, great, great learning. I personally, as a co-director of OBTO, I feel that today, Parik sir and myself were very, very satisfied in terms of Dr. Senthil's uh, thaw, you know, wording that finally we are discussing papers which are you know, by Indian people and India-centric, where at least now we will cross the double and uh, double digit, 30 to 40% of our OPD patients will be able to afford this low dose immunotherapy. And I think as Professor Tanok said that, just looking at two, three months survival or just looking at response rate, but without improvement in quality of life doesn't make any sense. Oral triponomic, triple metronomic therapy is extremely convenient for the patient. And I would definitely do it. And I have been doing it in my patients. And it is a given Kumar and Professor Tenok also would agree that in a platinum refractory patients, this should be so-called NCCN category one. Uh, I hope that day comes, Kumar. Till that time, thank you very much. All of you stay safe and we will meet you the next uh, second Tuesday of uh, December. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Amit sir. Excellent, excellent, as always. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can, we conclude? can we conclude the meeting? Good night, everyone. Good night.